Okay. Uh, oh, it works better when you understand. That old business, uh, we've got. Uh, okay. Is there anything going on? Check, check. I'm going to switch it to the Brio because they're saying they're not hearing it. Then again, it might be just a delay in the system. Really providing for us. So okay. uh, anyway, it's on the air and it's, uh, it's working just fine. Okay. And uh, we may or may not re replace those UPS batteries. Thank you. Um, the next on my list, we have estate equipment from people who have passed and they have given it to, not given it to the club, but said to the club, here, get rid of it, sell it, do something. Steven, he's the one that's, uh, he's, <laughs> he, I know he brought some equipment with him tonight. You can tell us about that in just a second. Well, a but but free, from yeah. now on, Steve is the guy, the go-to guy to buy any equipment that the club has for sale for whomever. But Steve's the one we go to. Okay, Steve, have at it. Okay, this is my prepared. Uh, a lot of the stuff is free. We're just giving it away if somebody has a need for it. If they don't, it's probably going into the e-waste bucket. Uh, we do have a HD 1410 uh, heat kick here. Uh, Price in that's 25 bucks, and that's firm because it's in really good shape and it works perfectly. And uh, I see them sell for a lot more than that on eBay. Uh, there's a CB set. I have no idea what the condition is. Uh, there's an old HT. The uh, 440 HT, uh, we decided to, Jim convinced us that we needed to hang on to that because it would be a good control receiver for uh, a repeater or some other use. So he, he latched onto that. Uh, one of the tuners that I'd sent out information about, uh, Steve has bought that, so uh, that's uh, taken care of. But take a look at it. Uh, if, the, if there's something there you want, it's free, just to take it. We've got a bunch of antennas. There's uh, whips for two meter rigs. Uh, there's a very curious, uh, I think it's a 10 meter antenna that comes in sections. Take a look at that. Thank you. And uh, there'll be more where that came from. This is all I could haul tonight. We'll just keep uh, emptying out yeah, stuff out of the uh, repeater shack. And if you know anybody that needs a lot of uh, microwave test equipment, uh, and talk to Al, he'll be on SEC. He's got a list of that stuff from uh, Adolph Wozniak's yeah. estate. Uh, we're trying to sell all that as well. And we have more. And you'll see more club emails coming out too. So just uh, keep your eyes open, and hopefully we can get it in hands of somebody who wants it. Thank you, Steve. Uh, last Sunday, last Sunday, Sunday before, Sunday. Sunday before, we had a fox hunt. Yeah. I don't know when it was. It was recently. I was there. <laughs> but anyway, we didn't win. <laughs> I know that. <laughs> but uh, Charles. <laughs> <laughs> Steve and Linda were the foxes, and Charles, you won, didn't you? Yes, you did. And I can't remember. I've slept a night or two since then. I can't remember where the fox yeah, uh, Oh, yes, I do remember. Go ahead. <laughs> well, second and third were a couple guys from Indianapolis who were kind of surprised. They made the trip all the way up to Fort Wayne to fox hunt with us, but these guys have been going all over the state. There's fox hunts in uh, Muncie and Bedford and the Indy area. They showed up, and uh, they were second, right behind, uh, right behind uh, Charles. And then uh, Charles, you had a ride along, and I forget right. the QHY is that his call? And there's a new guy. Yeah. It was up QHL, right? Yeah. 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 And, and we had guys uh, from Trine. And then we had uh, fifth and sixth were uh, Jim and uh, and Al, 
And uh, then the uh, and 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 Ann and Carol. Mm -hmm. Ann and Carol. <laughs> uh, those two. And uh, then uh, we had a group from uh, Troy University, so that was uh, really interesting to have them along and uh, expose them to the sport. So we'll do it again on April 11th, right? To avoid uh, Easter. Yeah, April 11th, mm -hmm. the next box hunt. Come on out, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, and Jim, you, used, you guys used to come out and box hunt. Well, I have to borrow some equipment, I do. Yes, you will. Yeah. Yes, you will. We can go ahead then. Handheld. Uh, Oh, the, yeah, we we'll get you an antenna. Okay. Plenty of antennas to give away. Thank you. <laughs> now, uh, you know, last year was our 100th year anniversary. We got, everything got squashed because of a pandemic. We're hoping to try and redo it 100 <coughs> plus one this year. We're going to see what we can do. Now Clark is not, now Clark isn't here, but last year he was uh, doing this uh, 100 contacts, so I don't know if he wants to continue doing that or not, but because he's not here. But that was one thing we did. We did get a proclamation from the mayor, and I presented it with at the field day last year. I can redo it again this year since we can have a few more people there. And we're going to see what else we can, what other mischief we can get into. And one of the things, since there is going to be ball games this year, get a station set up down at the ballpark. I will call Mike Nutter. And, uh, uh, and I know he was really interested in it last year. So I'm, I'm pretty sure he'll let us do it again, this, do it this year. And if anybody else has some great ideas for a Centennial Plus One, Please let us let the board members know, and we'll, yes. One of the things the club did last year was the Indiana Cusa party. Thank and you, we yes. From home. Did you want to talk more about that? You want me to just go right uh, ahead. Okay. But uh, so uh, we had a, quite a few of the club membership participate, and uh, the club actually crushed the old <laughs> record. We almost uh, doubled the old record, and uh, the next closest uh, club competitor in line was about half the points that we had. So uh, we, we won first place in the state of Indiana Club Cusa parties and we wanted to bring that trophy or that plaque home for the Fort Wayne Radio Club on their 100th year and we were successful. I don't know what, maybe Steve knows what may be in line for this year, I don't know. But well, we're thinking, gee was, this is so so great, why don't we go for a million points? Yeah, that'd be, uh, that'd be uh, pretty good. <laughs> hey, yeah. But uh, yeah, it's a great effort, we had 28, uh, club yeah, people turn in their gloves as a uh, club affiliation here, and yeah, we just blew that record away. The, the old record was like what 400,000, something like that, and 739,000 points. Yeah, it was hey, we can do it, we can make a million, mm -hmm. it's ambitious, good. but maybe. Yeah, sunspots are helping now, so that's yeah, it should be good. Cool, okay. Um. And then I talked about field day a little bit. That's coming up in June. And I'm hoping we can have a better, I mean, we had a pretty good one last year. But hopefully we can have a better one this year because we'll be able to get more people, more of us down there, hopefully. So, and that's the last full weekend in June. And it's down at the old fort. You guys need to come and you'd like that. Trust me, you'll like it. <laughs> Mama Carol says you'll like it. So um, anyway, uh, that's the next big thing. And are there any other contests that I'm not aware of that are coming up that you guys were going to participate in? Yes, Steve? Well, we got uh, two contests in April. They're local contests. Uh, the first one, I'm trying to remember the date. I think it's April 10th is the uh, AC Arts uh, VHF Simplex Contest. You can get the details on their website. And then I think it's two weeks later, we're gonna have a uh, two meter weak signal contest. It's sideband and CW only. And uh, the club is sponsoring it and we'll also take care of about three of the plaques. But uh, that should be a lot of fun. There's a lot more activity that's uh, happening now on uh, two meter sideband if you get you tune around uh, 144.200 or so, 
Uh, there's a bunch of guys uh, using it, getting on there. And on Friday nights, there's a net out of uh, up by Goodbye. Sherwood, Sherwood, Ohio. Yeah, on uh, 144.230. It's, uh, it's vertically polarized sideband, because this guy figures, well, a lot of people have these all-mode rigs, but they already have a gain vertical for two meters. Why don't we use it? And that's what he's doing. <coughs> so that's two more contests that are happening. Simplex is on the 10th. Simplex is on the 10th from 7 to 10 p.m. Okay. <coughs> okay. Thank you. Um, I Oh, yeah. Uh, the Little Red Barn luncheons are starting up again tomorrow, and they're going. It's it's going to be at um, Big Eye Fish on Wells Street at 11:30, and I can't wait. I'm so excited. <laughs> I like to eat. What can I say? And and the, and like being with people, and we'll finally be able to do that. Hello. And uh, let's see. Uh, anything else? Okay. Okay. We'll take a. Uh, I kind of. I have a lot of stuff here, and it kind of went through it rather quickly. Yes, Bob. For those of you that uh, get QSD magazine, you may have noticed that Carl Lutzel Schwab, K9 LA, has several articles published this month. If you're not aware of it, Carl is a Fort Wayne resident and writes one of the columns in the Allen County Hamden. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes. Are we into the new business yet? Yeah, we're there now. Okay. Hi, <laughs> May, Madam President. I uh, went to a seminar or show about the railroad, and it started out with uh, basically the railroad business. Society here in Fort Wayne. Well, I ran across an old telegraph operator back from the old days. He's in his 80s now, but you wouldn't know. It. He's a really sharp guy. So I contacted him and I asked him if he would uh, give his demonstration, like he did there at the the kind of the gardens uh, at the club. And he said, "I'd oh, be more than happy to." But he apologized. He says, "My code's a little different than yours." And I said, "That's okay. We'll we'll handle that. We aren't that prejudiced." <laughs> so uh, I contacted him. And uh, he's willing to uh, stop by any, any month that we'd like to. And I said, I, do we have a slot open in July? When, when's our next one? Uh, the next open spot is July. Okay. I would like to petition out for July to ask him to come in. Sounds and wonderful. He's really uh, quite interesting. He uh, started out as, as a kid learning code. His dad was a conductor. And he'll go through all this, how he learned code. Mm -hmm. And uh, he has a lot of keys. The old, keys, he'll bring those with you, and a clackers and so forth. And he talked about his call letters and everything, just like we had. He said, you could be dozing off, but Don and Honey, the, there were four operators at, in the peak at the same time. He said, you could be dozing off, and as soon as you hear your call letters, the three call letters, you'd wake up and you'd go over to the key. Oh, so God. he's a pretty sharp guy. Wonderful. I have the information, if I may submit that at this time. Sure. Oh, well, thank you. Here. Yeah. That's that takes more than because now we're up through July. Hey, yeah, this this year's yeah. going great. Yeah. The, there aren't too many of them left. The United States are probably just That's a handful of them that are left. So I would suggest if, if you see this gentleman, you'll probably see that that'll be the last time you ever see anybody do this because they're just they're just so far apart now. They just uh, yep, they're up in their eighties. The last time that the uh, the railroads stopped the code was in 1972. Oh my goodness. They they dropped the code. So these guys all, all in their 80s and 90s. Wonderful. Oh, thank you very much, Larry. Sure. sure. Our, our meeting next month, our um, <clears throat> speaker is going to be Jeff? Jeff Bauermeister. I never want to call, I always want to call him Bob. <laughs> but his name is Jeff Bauermeister. And uh, he and his father used to race pigeons pigeons and he's got all the equipment and everything and he's got all kinds of stuff and he's going to come to us next month and talk to us about racing pigeons which is kind of like pre amateur radio you know with messages. carrying messages yeah but these are racing pigeons 
they are, you know, you let them off here and to see how, who can beat you over there. Yeah. So anyway, he's going to talk to us. And then the following month in March, April, May, no, June. June is going to be, um, oh shoot, I put a card in, my, in here. Anyway, she's a sergeant, an information officer from the Fort Wayne Police Department. Sergeant Sonia, uh, I forget the rest of her name. It's three names. And I, I've heard her speak before. I could listen to her all day. She is fascinating, absolutely fascinating. And she says, and she'll come in her uniform and she'll be armed. But she says, you see me out on the street in my civvies with my kids? No, I am armed. She says, I am always armed. She says, you may not see it, but I am armed. But she's a wonderful speaker. And like I said, I could listen to her all day. So she will be our speaker then in June. And then in July, thanks to Larry, we've got, uh, got this. So if anybody else has great ideas for a speaker, please let, let me or the board know, we'll be happy to take care of it. And tonight we're going to have Carlos. We're going to take a little few minute break. Cool. And then uh, Carlos, uh, Felix. <laughs> That's one of my two last names. She, she has three names. I So do I. Yes, you do. So there you go. So, um, so anyway, Car Carlos Felix. Well, I even have your call down, KD9OLN. That's the one. Anyway, he was going to be speaking with us tonight about his, I'm glad it's him and not me, <laughs> <laughs> skydiving and, and transmitting and filming and all that kind of stuff while he's parachuting. So anyway, we'll take about a five, six minute break and then I'll turn everything over to Carlos. So before you guys go, just know that I have a camera running up here and if you don't want to be in the camera, just don't come forward of that camera. Some people are shy about the camera, just letting you know where it's at. They're in this protection aid. Just in you know, the protection aid. You don't want to come up free on the little table. Whatever doesn't get taken home. These guys are trying to take them, which is wonderful. I have more at home. I'll bring them next time. I'll work them on. So you're in if you want to. Well, we're not currently. We're not currently. Who's talking? Who's talking? Who's talking? I ended up winning last year, the VHF contest on the base, the base station. So it was surprising to me. I know there's some pretty stiff competitors out there. I'm up with some Sawyer or something. But nobody ever touched me with a mobile or a rover. Now I find her hard. Sophia Rosales Scatina. Yep, two. She's Latina. Has two last names. Yep. By the way, you're getting complimented on running the meeting by the people on my YouTube channel. Oh, really? They're saying that this is running way better than their local meeting, so, so there you go. Awesome. <laughs> I'm impressed. Thank you. <laughs> I'm just, just relaying what they're saying. <laughs> Me too. And you just you, you move right through it. <laughs> oh, no, I try to. <laughs> Sometimes. 
The way uh, KM5 or JFN says my old neighbor raised pigeons, it was awesome to watch. So the presentation I think is going to be good. There's a Montas KDO radio is talking about he's seen racing pigeons. He raised some pieces kind of that he's doing it to my channel and you're talking about racing pigeons next week. Uh, there you go. <laughs> Do they have a vending machine here? I have no idea. Tell them to put my hand up so I can see that vending machine if they do it. Be right back. I would suggest
Thank you. Yeah, I will talk to you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And there, right through that door, when you leave through this one mark on the far left, on the far right, us, if you go straight through, that's the Maker Lab, and they are going to be there. So if, on the way out, if you want to talk to them, you want to just stop. Thank you. Okay, gentlemen. Take your shoe off. You're being called. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, gentlemen, we're going to start the uh, second half of the meeting, which is the presentation by Carlos Felix about jumping out of a very good airplane <laughs> and doing video and two meter operation and why somebody wants to do this i have no idea but sounds like a fun time yeah it's exactly the reason i do this it's because it's a fun time it is a riot if you've never done it highly recommend you go skydiving well felix have at it all right folks i don't know do i need this or is my voice enough y'all tell me Use the mic. I like that. all right cool let me uh Mic volume up a bit. Here we go. So, my name is Carlos uh, KD9OLM. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, and uh, I play parachute mobile. Some of us play par uh, mobile in the car. Some of us go to the parks and play parks on the air. I prefer to do it from the sky. So, I have the tallest antenna in the Midwest for about 10 minutes at a time. Uh, and uh, if you tune in, you get a QSL card. So, part of, oh, oh, there we go. part of what I also do is uh, I'm also a videographer and a photographer uh, in, on the ground and primarily on the air as well. And every picture that you see tonight is something I've taken in the sky somehow, either through my GoPro or through my normal DSLR, which weighs quite a bit on my noggin, but it works really well. Um, one thing I did forget tonight was bringing a copy of my QSL card. Uh, but the pictures that I use on the QSL card are actually right there. So this, that sunset is the main picture on the, the QSL card. And then this one right here with the radio on my right hand is the backside where I put all the information about the contact. Uh, don't have one physically with me, sorry. All right, so who am I? Uh, Carlos, KD9OLN, said that already. Uh, I made my first skydive uh, in 2011. Got my license for skydiving in 2012. I got my first instructional skydiving rating in 2015. That happens to be coach. Uh, after that, I went ahead and got my accelerated free fall instructor rating and a tandem instructor rating. I'm also a photographer and videographer. I have 900-ish uh, jumps. Uh, got my amateur tech ticket December of 2019. Upgraded to general in January of 2020 and the extra I'm still studying for. I'll get around to it at some point in time. Hopefully soon. I'm trying to beat that uh, $35 tax from the FCC. Uh, and my real work, my real day job is working in IT. I noticed that the plane is, the name is Perfectly Good Airplane. <laughs> that is actually the, the, the website we have. Uh, PerfectlyGoodAirplane.com will take you to uh, the website for uh, the skydiving center I work at. So it's a bit of a drive, but if you want to make a tandem skydive, I highly recommend it. <laughs> yeah, the other bit on the image there is Life at Terminal Velocity. That is the name of my company. So everybody's first concern is how safe is this? So I've decided the first real slide here would be talking about the parachute system itself. Uh, the parachute system itself is certified by the FAA. It has to meet very stringent standards, obviously. <laughs> uh, there are manufacturers of parachute systems that are not made in the FAA, in the U.S. that are FAA certified and some that are not FAA certified. If it's not certified by the, U the FAA, it cannot fly in the U.S. Uh, the parachute system has two parachutes. Ta-da! I brought my parachute system with me tonight. Believe it or not, there's two parachutes in here. 
There's one on the top. That's the reserve. I hope never need it, but it's there just in case. And then there's the one in the bottom, and that's the main. Uh, the main takes from about here down, and the reserve is from there up. Uh, this, this system, I didn't put it on the slide, but this system weighs about 20 pounds all told. So it's a backpack, decently weighted backpack. So if anybody wants to heft this, you're welcome to it. All I ask is these two red handles, don't grab by there, please. <laughs> please, 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 please. Anywhere else in the harness, you're welcome to handle. Uh, the system has an onboard uh, computer, believe it or not. It's really just a simple barometer. It knows when I'm on the ground and it knows when I'm in the sky. If I'm still doing free fall speeds at 1,000 feet, automatically deploys my reserve. If I'm still in free fall at 1,000 feet, I have either done something, something terribly wrong or I'm passed out or maybe worse, right? Inevitably, the, if the, per, uh, the AAD is there, that's uh, very inexpensive life insurance. My main parachute's 135 square feet. This only matters to you in that the smaller the parachute, the faster I lose altitude. So if I had a bigger parachute, instead of 10 minutes, I might have 12 minutes in the sky or uh, maybe longer, depending on the parachute. Uh, when I do a, a solo with a tandem system, tandem system's 300 square, 340 square feet, the one that I use, it's easy for me to be in the sky for 15 minutes if I open up at 5,000 feet. So if I were to open that up at 13,000 feet, I'd be in the sky for a half hour. Um, my reserve is 143 square feet. Obviously, I like uh, having a little bit bigger parachute. If it comes to the point where I need my reserve, that extra square footage helps me get my wits about me and make a little gentler landing. I wear three altimeters. And I have them in my backpack. Hang on. Should have pulled them out. These, one of each goes in, my, in each wrist. It tells me the altitude as, I'm, as we're climbing, and it tells me the altitude as we're getting lower to the ground. Uh, once you're in the th over 1,000 foot, it marks one point whatever. So 1.1 1 .1 would be 1,100 feet. They tell me the altitude above ground level, not sea level. That comes into play later. And then my helmet has also an altimeter that's audible that emits a tone, emits several different tones that let me know at what altitude I am. I have those memorized, I know what they mean, which also means I know what altitude I am when they go off. In preparation for making uh, a radio jump, before I even go to the people that run the, the place and say I want to get on the next load or the next available slot, I make sure that my batteries are charged. My radio is uh, tuned to 146.520 on BFOA or 146.50 uh, depending on what it is I'm working that day or that jump. Uh, VFOB is tuned to 14439 and uh, APRS is turned on, GPS is turned on, and logging is turned on. I fly with a Yesu FT3D right now. Uh, I may play the Baofeng game later, but uh, I don't have APRS on that, and I like the idea of people actually being able to see where I'm at in the sky when the uh, packets re reach a digipeter. Um, the radio is attached to my, to my backpack, but I'm pretty sure all of you have seen an FT3D by now, and if you haven't, there's one there. You're welcome to look at it. Uh, and it is tethered to myself, it's important that I mention this, it is tethered to myself by way of 550 cord, parachute cord if you will, and a carabiner. I have zero desire to crush someone's skull in with a falling radio <laughs> or to lose a $350 piece of kit. It's just, you know, uh, that, that's, believe it or not, that's one of the biggest gripes I get online. It's like, you're gonna drop that radio in, you're gonna hurt somebody. It's like, no, it's tethered to me. Uh, when I go up, uh, make sure that my antenna is coiled up in a way that's easy to deploy. If it's uh, a whip, obviously, it's very difficult to do that. But uh, I mostly fly a, a, a Slim Jim.
I have a couple of them, right? Uh, these are two meter Slim Jims. Uh, one is made by a guy called Nelson something or other. other. He sells them on eBay. I happen to like it. It works really well. And then the other one is from Ed9 Tax Lab. Uh, he's somewhere out in northwest Indiana. Uh, they, uh, Nelson is in Michigan. So they're somewhat local to us. Uh, so you can see they're coiled up. I don't have the weights that I would normally put on these, but normally I would attach uh, de uh, lead le uh, decoy lead uh, weights if you are at all interested in waterfowling you know what lead uh, weights are for decoys and if not just small bar of lead that weighs about eight ounces uh, with a bit of string attached to the end of the antennas works really well and then my helmet is, uh, uh, has my headset and a rubber band around the radio ready to keep the uh, jack for the headset attached to the radio. So you look at this and you go, that doesn't look like much of a headset. That's because I had to chop it up. Uh, the band that goes around it, this is a Heil HTH-Y, and the Y is for Yesu. Uh, and he makes them in different configurations for different handy talkies. And I had to take the band off from the surrounding area because otherwise it won't fit in my helmet. Uh, when this is in my helmet, it's not pleasant. So I try not to make too many parachute ju uh, uh, jumps with this on it on a day. Uh, but it's the only way I have found where people are able to hear me well and that I'm able to hear people really well. Uh, I can turn up the, the, the volume on the radio, it isn't a problem, but if I use the radio mic, people say, you have a lot of wind noise. Well, yeah, no kidding, I'm 14,000 feet. Yes. Do you uh, run the radio with a box? Say, no, I, uh, I actually, this has a PTT on it, and I attach the PTT to uh, my uh, shoulder, my, my ch chest strap, so that I'm able to just key it up when I need to. Otherwise, I think the wind noise might key it up. So once I make sure that all that is good to go, then I go tell Manifest, hey, I'd like to get on a load. Typically, a load it takes 15 minutes to go from the ground to back uh, dropping skydivers. So, and you know, most of the time, I'm, the drop zone has a load or two full out. So normally about a 45 minute time frame before I'm up in the sky. <laughs> it's something I've heard a lot. But first, you don't succeed. Skydiving is not for you. Some funny guy. I don't know if I said that first, but I thought it was funny. So how do I promote the jump? I call CQ a lot on the internet. Uh, I post on social media primarily on Facebook, and if you're familiar with a thing called Discord, uh, Discord is just a chat server. Uh, there are a couple of Discord servers for ham radio operators. One is uh, Ham Radio Crash Course. Another one is Toad's uh, Discord. Uh, uh, there are very, very specific chat servers for ham radio operators. Uh, and I'll go on there and on Facebook and say, hey, I'm about to go do this. Or if I know, for example, that I'm going this weekend, I'm not, I wish. Uh, I'll say, hey, I'm, this week and I'm planning on doing jumps, be on the lookout so that people that are in the area or at least within a couple hundred miles that are, might be interested in, in giving it a try are able to be on the lookout, hey, yeah, he's going to jump. Uh, the details matter, feed as much information as possible. So if I tell you on Wednesday that I'm planning on doing it this weekend, then on Friday I'll verify, hey, I am in fact going to be jumping tomorrow or Sunday. And then when I know on Saturday, hey, it's going to happen sometime in the 1 or 2 o'clock uh, time frame, I'll continue to update. And then when the time comes and I'm actually on load, I'll post everything about the jump on a single post. I'm jumping on load X. If you go to this website, we have a website keeping track of the loads. Uh, you can look for my name on load whatever. And the number on the top is how many minutes until we take off. From that time, 12 minutes later, I'll be getting out of the airplane. Plan accordingly, right? Uh, frequency, 
and uh, how I expect to communicate. So if I'm working split, I'll say I'm working split, whatever the case might be, the details of the communications are there. Uh, I also will post that on the Discord for Ham Radio Crash Course and on Toad's Discord so that anyone who's really interested has an opportunity to see that, yeah, he's about to jump and I'm going to try to work him. If I need to update it, I do. Sometimes the loads get pulled sooner and sometimes the loads get pushed out. Just depends, you know, if a weather front moves in and keeps us from skydiving. Well, guess what? That 45 minute call might turn into a two hour call. Don't know, letting you know that we're on hold. Um, and if possible, I go live on the airplane. Live meeting, I'll go either on my YouTube channel or on uh, Facebook and just go Facebook Live. Hey, I'm inside of the airplane. I can't hear you. I really can't. It's way too loud. But you can see what we're doing, getting ready. We lose the signal about 8,000 feet. It's when the cell phone basically just says, there's no more juice. There's not, not enough signal here to continue and just dies, which is fine. And then if I have time and I have a, a whip, uh, obviously if I'm flying with the uh, j Paul Slim Jim, it's really impossible for me to extend that inside of the airplane, but if I have uh, a whip with me, the pilots already I've already talked to the pilot, the pilot has no problem with it, I'll get on and hit a repeater that's you know, 20 or 30 miles away, let people know, spread the word, I'm in the sky, five more minutes. So, everything needed for the jump, I gather everything up, parachute system, which is right there, my helmet is right there, my altimeters are in my wrist, uh, I have the right antenna connected to the radio, the cameras are on my helmet and everything is charged up, it's time to go, right? This is the coming in for landing. We're in the airplane and it's two minutes to exit. I took this picture because this is pretty much where I normally sit, next to the pilot because I'm typically the last out. Pilot calls two minutes verbally or with uh, a red light, a flashing red light. We have a semaphore in the back of the airplane that he can control from the front. Flash the red light twice, that's two minutes. Everybody check your gear, check your friends, make sure everything is safe. We're two minutes out. That's my cue to double check myself. I check everything about my skydiving gear first because without it, I'm not going to make it. And I really want to make it. Uh, once I verify all my, all my parachute gear is ready, then I'll also verify my radio. I'll pull the radio out, attach it to my chest strap, turn the radio on, enable voice recording on the radio. I have uh, an SD card on the radio just specifically for the recording of the voice. I verify the VFO is still on the proper frequency. I lock the radio to make sure that I don't bump it around and change it by mistake because I've done that before. I learned from my mistake. Uh, I attach the headset, put the rubber band around it to make sure it doesn't fall out. Guess what? Also learned it by mistake. Rubber band is needed. Uh, and if possible, and I have that whip still handy, I'll hit up another repeater. Hey, we're going to go jump in, playing radio. Come on out. When it's time to go, that's what I see. Planes flying away. This is a, a sunset jump, and I've been every word of it. It's, the sun is setting. You can see it just on the edge of the picture. Typically the last out, average exit altitude is 14,000 feet uh, mean sea level. In Rochelle, Illinois, that's about 13,200 feet above the ground. I free fall for five to 10 seconds, and then I deploy. Check my parachute. Again, before I play radio, we go back to that safety thing. Just because you have a parachute over your head doesn't mean it's good. Check it, make sure it's good to go. If it is, then I pull out the antenna, deploy the antenna, and start to work. By that time, it's 11,500 feet or so. Then I make sure the radio is recording because it's been me the butt before. And then I work the radio until 3,000 feet. 3,000 feet, there is no more playing on the radio. If you call me at 3,000 feet, I will send you a QSL card, but you will not hear from me because I am stopped with the radio. So as we progress and I make calls, I'll let you know, hey, I'm at 7,000, I'm at 5,000, and so on and so forth, and at, at about 3,200 feet, I'll say last call. 
At 3,000 feet, I'm done, period. I don't care how juicy that contact is, I am not keying that radio or <laughs> unless I'm above 3,000 feet. A few more pictures. A friend of mine taking a tandem student on the left. Uh, my parachute opening at 11,700 feet. I don't know if you can see that on the projector or not, but my altimeter, you can actually read it on the picture. It says 11.7. 11 That's 11,700 feet above ground. And then another one of my friends leaving on a different jump, taking a, a tandem student. You can't really see the instructor behind the student, but I guarantee you the instructor's there. Now comes the real part about the ham aspect of this, right? What have I learned? Because I really don't do this just for the sake of doing it, because I want to see how things work and I want to learn things. I've learned that this antenna design matters a lot. It matters a lot more up there than it does down here. Antenna orientation matters even more. And that 146.520 is alive and well. I'll get into details about this, but trust me, if you go home tonight and you have a mobile in your car and you tune, in, tune into 146.52 and you don't hear anything, it's because your antenna is not high enough. Simple. At 3,000 feet, the chatter is constant. All right, let's talk about antenna design. It's a tall tower and all I have is QRP power, so I got to make the most of it, right? Five watts on an HT, not a lot. Takeoff angle on a Slim Jim when dangling upside down is not something we normally think about. We think about a takeoff angle and in reality, it becomes a landing angle. And it's drifting behind me at about a 45 degree angle, so I'm aimed, uh, the, the directionality of the antenna is aimed towards the ground and towards the sky. And at first I thought it was warming clouds and I wasn't because well, one of my contacts turning around gave me more distance. I was using the sky to bounce the signal back down. Verticals have a, a good reach in general, but they have terrible local performance when you're 14,000 feet. There is a very, very, very clear null under you when you're that high. Uh, I primarily jumped a Slim Jim because my goal is distance, and I found out that the one that's gonna give me the most distance is by flying with that Slim Jim aimed in the direction that I wanna hit. Either that or whatever the wind will give me. If the winds are blowing a little too hard, I can't uh, exactly aim it. I have to take whatever the wind is giving me. So antenna orientation, the takeoff angle on a Slim Jim, the top uh, graphic is uh, what it looks like from the ground, right? You have a takeoff angle. Uh, I don't remember what the number on that is, but it's something like eight, eight or nine degrees or something like that. Well, if it were perfectly vertical in the sky and it's dangling below me, then that angle inverts, right? So now I'm aiming like an umbrella towards the ground. But the reality of it is that it's trailing behind me even though I have weights on it, it's trailing behind me. So I have a, a, a part of the pattern that's aiming almost directly at the ground, and I have a, pattern, a part of the pattern that's aiming away and behind me into the clouds. And if the weather conditions are just right, that gives me extra reach. You don't think about that when you mount that end fed on the ground. You just don't. I know I don't. I don't. It's not common. CQ is uh, calling is easier when the frequency is open. Uh, 146.52 is very much alive. On the ground, it's dead as doornails. You'll find a contact every once in a while. Once you break about 3,000 feet and above, the chatter is constant. It's never ending. It is impossible for me to be a good ham and wait for a break in the conversation because there's never a break in the conversation. If I wait for a break in the conversation, I'll never make a contact. And it's because people are rat chewing on the 146.52 frequency instead of just calling and shifting. So if you use 146.52 to do rat chew, tisk, 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 shift. Um, it is incredible how many people you hear once you break that 3,000 foot barrier or so. It's unbelievable. And if you watch any of my videos, 
you'll hear it. The, the chatter is absolutely constant. Some of the answers to the most common questions I get, longest distance contact, uh, 219 miles on voice, ballpark, uh, on uh, 305 miles on APRS. Again, ballpark. That APRS contact could be off by 20 miles because it was a gentleman driving a semi and he couldn't tell me exactly where he was when I contacted him when I was on the ground. He actually made a CUSA with me later on, but he was on his way from somewhere in Minnesota back and he was in Wisconsin when he made the CUSA. Uh, I get about 10 minutes of working time from 14,000 feet with the Kirk parachute I fly. My vertical speed is 11 miles an hour, ballpark. My horizontal speed is 25 miles an hour, give or take. That is with zero wind. Okay? There's almost never zero wind. So if I have a 50 mile an hour headwind, I'm actually traveling backwards 25 miles an hour relative to the ground. All these speeds are relative to the ground. Uh, if I'm flying with the wind and the wind is doing 50, guess what? I'm doing 75. Yes, I have passed semis doing 75, 80 miles an hour on the highway because I'm flying with the wind. And if the wind's kicking, you know, like a, it's not uncommon for the winds to be over 80 knots at 14,000 feet, and I've passed semis on the highway that way. Uh, the radio is attached to me with a tether. I've said this before, but I feel like I need to reiterate it as a, an FAQ. No, I don't want to crush someone's skull with a falling radio. That's just irresponsible and not financially savvy because it's expensive. Uh, the exit point is calculated based on the wind speed and direction. Uh, primary winds where I skydive are from the northwest, so typically we're getting out of northwest of where we were going to land. Uh, and how far, it depends exactly on how fast the winds are. The higher the winds, the farther out we go. The lower the winds, the closer to the drop zone we, we get out. The landing is, the goal is always to land back at the drop zone. Be, uh, the, People ask me, well, where do you choose to land? At the drop zone. I planned this out. Really, I swear I did. Uh, out of 900-ish skydives, I think I have landed off twice. And one of them was on purpose. So it's an intentional landing back at the drop zone. We get out uh, with the intent of making it back to the drop zone. The drop zone itself isn't exactly responsible for me, but they like to know that I'm OK. And the easiest way for them to know that I'm OK is if I land back there. If I land off, I carry my cell phone with me at all times so when I'm on a jump. If I land off, I have my cell phone, I'll call them and say, hey, I'm okay, or I'll call EMS and say, hey, come help me, and then I'll call the drop zone and say, I, I'm hurt, but I have help on the way. Come and get my gear so that the EMS don't turn it up, tear it up. KD9OLN.com is just a redirect to my uh, YouTube channel. If you want to watch any videos of uh, me jumping out of a perfectly good airplane and playing radio, are there. Uh, and if you have any questions, I'd love to take them. I have a question. Go ahead. So how expensive is this hobby? The question being, how expensive is this hobby? To me or to you? <laughs> <laughs> so in general terms, I'm an instructor. I get paid to do this. If uh, on, a, on a jump like this where I'm not, uh, when I'm not teaching someone, it's just on me, it's going to cost me $27 to go in the sky. Uh, my parachute rig and all my gear adds up to, just skydiving gear adds up brand new to about eight grand. Um, getting a license costs about three grand. So it's not an inexpensive hobby, but then again, compared to ham radio, it's peanuts. <laughs> Sometimes. Sometimes I pay a packer to pack it for me. Uh, when I'm doing things like this and I have time, absolutely I pack my own parachute. It's no big deal. It takes me all 15 minutes. I can do it here on the carpet right now if I wanted to. As a matter of fact, I brought a closing device just in case I, somebody wanted to see the parachute. I just open it and close it right back up. Uh, if I'm in instructor mode, I pay a packer to pack it for me because the 15 minutes that I spent packing it, which I can't, is 15 minutes that I can't give to my student to debrief them, and I would rather take the time to debrief them. It cost, cost me seven bucks. 
seven bucks is nothing when it comes. I'm not making a terrible amount of money doing this, but if I have to pay someone seven bucks so I can have an extra 15 minutes with my student, I would rather pay seven bucks and spend the extra, spend the extra time with my student. Why do you need a license? Why do I need a license? Because the FAA won't let me jump without one. It's, uh, it's like driving on the highway, right? Can you drive without a license? Yeah, of course you can. Is it smart to? No. So uh, most drop zones will not let you jump without uh, a license from the United States Parachute Association. The USPA is our governing body. Can you skydive without one? There are some places where you can. Absolutely. Is it smart? No. Uh, the USPA runs middlemen uh, between us skydivers and the FAA, and the FAA very much wants to regulate the living deadlines out of everything that's aviation. So uh, the USPA is our governing body, and they play, you know, keeper, if you will. They make sure that the people that are in the sky are licensed so that the hassle from the FAA is minimized. I have no clue. Where is the, uh, the aircraft that you jump out of based? The aircraft that I jumped out of is based at the drop zone and is in Rochelle, Illinois. There are other drop zones that are near here uh, that also have their own aircraft, so it just depends on where you are. Uh, the aircraft I jump out of, in Illinois, Rochelle, Illinois. Any other questions? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, sir. What is the youngest and the oldest the person you jumped with? The youngest person I've jumped with, by law, 18 years old. Makes it real easy. Uh, the eldest person I've jumped with, uh, I took the daughter of a gentleman that was 102, and she was 81, I think. I want to say she was 81 or 80, it's in that neighborhood. So there's no excuse. Age is not an excuse. So don't tell me you're too old for this, because you're not. You had a question, sir? Yeah, well, I'm mean, follow up on that one. So you must hit the ground pretty softly. And when, first point. Go ahead. So when we're doing tandems, uh, we intentionally land them exceedingly gentle. That's our goal. Uh, most of the time, I'm going to slide it in on my butt. Uh, and I'm going to make contact with the ground before you, and I'm going to flare that canopy so that you feel the least amount. Are, you, are your pants going to get a grass stain? Yep. But basically, you're just going to feel the friction of the grass in your butt. Uh, depending on winds, I may stand it up, but the butt sliding in on your butt at our drop zone is very safe. Uh, our drop zone has a very clean landing area. The stones have been removed. The, the grass has been maintained. There's nothing in that landing area that's going to hurt us if we slide in. If there were rocks there, I would absolutely stand it up every time. Okay. Second question, uh, Rochelle, Illinois. Do you know about what that is for mileage? from there to, let's say, Fort Wayne, and uh, as the crow flies, and I looked at some two-meter transmissions to see what kind of the maximums are from the ground with a certain 60 or 90 feet antennas and that, and so it sounds like with just even only five watts, if you can hit a couple hundred miles, that's incredible, because these guys are running uh, like, you know, 7,500 watts, 50 watts, to, to try to get that kind of mileage out of a on-ground system, and they both would have to have that, of course. So, but obviously, you're, you're doing it with five watts. So, yeah, the, the question being, you know, how far can we reach? I'm, I'm repeating the question, so you're not catching it as A, because some of you may not be hearing it, and the other one is, I have a YouTube stream going, and they may want to know what it is, and they may not hear, uh, the microphone may not pick that up. Uh, the theoretical limit, I did the calculation at some point in time, it was something like 200 miles in each way, so I haven't quite hit that distance uh, in terms of, of straight line. Actually, a half, if that's 200 and some odd. Uh, once you take the, the curvature of the Earth and the aid from the uh, atmosphere, it, it can hit over 300 miles. Um, the, you know, my goal, oh, the other question was how far are we, are we here from Rochelle? Uh, nautical miles, I did the math one day and it was like 210 nautical miles. I built a Yagi to aim this way because I want to make contact with here. So please pay attention to the social media postings that I make because I really want to be able to put an, uh, uh, a QSL card in the mail to someone in Fort Wayne or, the, or this area when I'm jumping in Rochelle. 
Uh, I've done it in Angola, and of course I've got people in the area here, but it's not as far. I want that long haul contact. Do you reside here in Fort Worth? I live in Columbia City. So the question was, where do I live? Yes, sir. And would you ready to touch down? Uh, I, I know you uh, you do some controlling. Uh, is is there a way you can actually stall out and, and fall out of it or fall out of the sky? Actually, that is, if the question is how do we land, right? How do we deal with the uh, maneuvering the parachute? We're actively, like an aircraft, we're actively doing a controlled stall of the aircraft. Just my wing is no different than a, than a wing on a plane. It has similar shape. It's, uh, in, you know, it's not a solid, it's a ram air wing. But we're actively trying to stall the wing the moment we touch our feet on the ground. So we're trading vertical, uh, say, yeah, vertical lift, negative, uh, for horizontal to glide it out and then make a really gentle touchdown. I can, uh, on a sports parachute, my landing is gentler than if I were to stand up on that chair and jump down. Any other questions? You ever talk to any military people that have been involved? Is your, your jump a, a lot different than their jump? Uh, so I'll, on prior service, I know what that's like. Uh, they uh, skydiving or parachuting, I should say, in the military is a completely different animal. Uh, rounds are, can't really be steered, they can't really be flared. You pound in your landings, they hurt incredibly. I've seen it, it's not pleasant. I have zero desire to make one of those. <laughs> uh, my brother in law uh, was a paratrooper, and he is coming to do a jump uh, actually, a couple of jumps with me this summer. And it's because he wants to know what it's like to actually have control of a parachute, even though he has oodles of jumps under around. Questions? University guys, I know you have something to ask. I'm going to put you on the spot. Bueller, Bueller. You probably don't get that reference because you're way too young for that. <laughs> Sorry, say again? Yeah, but, what would, but do you have a question about this? Well, KD90 will will take you to my YouTube channel. Uh, I have a number of parachute mobile jumps in there. I have a couple other things on there. Um, if there are no other questions, I'll give the floor. Oh, hang on, I have one more. You're, the typical aircraft you jump out of, as we see, what type of aircraft is it? Uh, so that's the one that I jump out of in Rochelle is a Cessna Carab Grand, let's see, Grand, Super Grand, Super Grand Caravan. So it's a Grand Caravan with a modification that takes it from stock, uh, the stock motor on it, if I remember right, is something like 600 horsepower. We have a 900 horsepower uh, motor. Gets us up faster, gets the pilot down faster, which means he can make more turns. He gets paid help okay. with the cycles. Yes, sir. Have you, uh, have you ever looked into using, a, it's called a big wheel antenna? Uh, have I looked into using a big wheel antenna? I've never heard of one. I'm going to look it up when I get home because if it's something that I can carry with me in the airplane and extend my range, I'll absolutely try it. It's, uh, the, the, that antenna is known for uh, high altitude balloon uh, uh, communication. Okay. Yeah. I will look into it because you know, if I can take the if I can take the contacts beyond 300 miles on APRS and beyond 219 miles on voice, I, I'm going to try. Absolutely going to try. It's worth whatever the antenna costs, just to be able to say, yeah, I have a 400 mile contact on two meters of five watts. <laughs> yes, sir. Just interested in, in how people get involved in things. How did you get interested in skydiving in the first place? How did I get interested in skydiving in the first place? Uh, let me tell you. The Army has a great recruiting tool. <laughs> the Army has a parachute team called the Golden Knights. I saw the Golden Knights jump when I was four years old, and I fell in love with the idea of doing that. And I eventually joined the Army thinking that I might do the Golden Knight thing. And then I found out that you actually have, at the time, you actually had to have a license already, and I was like, I can't afford that, so I'm not gonna be a skydiver. It's just not gonna happen for me. And being a paratrooper was not, I was like, I saw that, I was like, that hurts, no thanks. Uh, <laughs> 
So my, you know, after many years of hearing me say, oh, I'm going to do that someday, oh, I'm going to do that someday, oh, I'm going to do that someday, my wife finally got sick and tired of hearing me say, I'm going to do that someday. And she got me two tandems for my birthday in 2010. It was a hunting season, and I said, there's no way in this world I'm not going to, I'm going to go skydiving instead of being in a tree trying to kill Bambi. I like, I like meat in my freezer. Venison is delicious. Uh, so I put it off until April of 2011, and she said, oh, by the way, if you give me one of those tandems, I'll go with you. I said, score! Awesome! Yes, let's do this. A friend of mine came with us, uh, and uh, I, I will confess that I was perfectly fine on the ground, and the moment we got into the airplane, my brain went, what in the hell is wrong with me? <laughs> I have no one to impress. I, what, I don't have to impress her. She's already been married to me for 15 years. She's not going to divorce me because I don't do this. So my brain is trying to figure out a way out of this. And my brain goes, oh, I know exactly what's going to happen. She's going to chicken out. And if she chickens out, I'm going to be the awesome husband. I'm going to go, no, honey, I, even though I want to do this, I'm going to stay here on the plane with you. Because I care about you. We got to we got to fourteen thousand feet. That door opened, and my freak out was in full effect. And I'm like, oh. and the fun jumpers leave. The fun jumpers meeting the people that have licenses that do this for fun, like me. Um, and she is the first tandem, and I'm thinking, okay, she's gonna quit any minute, and there she's gone. <laughs> And for about 10 seconds, my brain said, Perry, my friend Perry, he's not going to go. I'm going to be the best friend. I'm not going to go. I'm going to stick with Perry. And the next thing I know, Perry's gone. And I'm thinking, uh-oh. Either I go or my, or my man card gets revoked. So I went. Uh, little did my wife know that she was buying me, you know, bought me a gift into uh, an addiction. I mean, I'll confess this is an addiction. is fantastic. It's, it's a feeling that you just can't not explain. It's euphoric. That, that's how I got involved in this. Got my ham ticket because Puerto Rico, I'm from Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico went through a very nasty hurricane where there were no communications for uh, the better part of four months. And I was sick and tired of not being able to find out if my family was okay. And I decided I've been Thinking about this for a long time, I just need to get off my butt and do this so that when the next hurricane happens, I can at least try to make contact with people in Puerto Rico and find out about my family. And that's where I'm at. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, have you employed directional antennas, you know, to try to get to some specific uh, longer distance point? How I employed directional antennas is the question, and the answer is not yet. I built the tape measure Yagi that I need to figure out a way of, of reinforcing it that doesn't get in the way. Uh, because I took it outside on a day that we were having like 30 mile an hour winds on the ground and the thing folded. So if it happens on the ground, it's going to happen in the sky. and I, It's pointless to take an antenna that I can't deploy in the sky. So I have to figure out a way of, of making the tape on the tape, uh, on the uh, you know, measuring tape Yagi uh, a little more rigid and still be able to collapse it. So. Most people that build these, uh, build them with PVC that's glued together and whatnot. Instead of doing that, what I did is I used shock cord, uh, and I strung shock cord through the whole thing so that instead of gluing it, I can just take it apart, and now it's a tiny bundle that I can stick into the cargo pocket of my pants and take that the same way as I take the rolled up coiled uh, Slim Jim. But yes, it's on my list of things that I've got to do because it's going to give me more distance for sure. Something else to put on your, your list to think about is going to UHF because you can get essentially the you know equivalent gain with a much smaller dimension, uh, and then you got to trade off the the uh, free space loss uh, you know be, because of the difference in frequencies. But it's something to think about. So try UHF. Yeah, I'll, I'll add it to the list. I mean, I've already done two meters a bunch of times. May as well jump to seventy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I did buy an HF rig that I can carry with me. I'm in the process of building a pack that I can sling in the front so that sometime this year, hopefully, I can uh, do HF. I, I don't know if anybody was going to ask that, but I figured I'd throw that out there. Uh, hopefully, I'll get around to doing some HF uh, from 14,000 feet or so. Uh, I am going to build a ZEP antenna for that, and uh, it's bound to be interesting. Yes, sir? Would that be a, a trailer then on HF? You'd be, you'd 
deploy the wire and it would trail behind you? So the question is, would it trail behind me? And the answer is yes. Uh, I wouldn't put any weight on it. I would just maybe put a piece of fabric on it so it actually catches air and trails directly behind me. The idea is to build either a ZEP, which is the same as a Slim Jim, just bigger, uh, uh, or some other form of an infant half wave with uh, a ballon on it, that then or an un un on it, and that then feeds into the radio. Like the aircraft used to do the, with the air, air wire. Device. Exactly, exactly like aircraft used to do. That's how I, I, I figured I have to look up somewhere because someone's done this before, and sure enough, that's how I came up with the ZEP. I'm like, well, well, this already exists, and I looked at the at how the ZEP is built. I'm thinking, this looks suspiciously like a Slim Jim. And it is. <laughs> Any other questions? Have I bored everybody to death by now? No. I hope no. not. <laughs> well, thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlos. That was, that was fascinating. Thank you. It really was. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I think everybody loved it. So thank you again. Okay, everybody, uh, and the next meeting is, uh, uh, I don't know the date, but it's next month, the third, thir third Wednesday of the month at 6 o'clock, right here. And uh, we've got a good program for that one, too. I don't know, I don't, I mean, she's good, but I don't know if she can be him. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, that's pretty awesome. So thank you all for coming. Be safe, and we'll see you next month. Thank you. Of course, my YouTube channel's at saying, HF, 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 like, yes, I know. Say again? I sincerely hope so. I hope that when I get up there, with an HF rig, it turns yeah, into a pileup that I can't manage. I, I sincerely hope it's one of those. Look, all the all you US stations, sorry, no. Give me everybody but the US. Dissolve the X. Let's go. <laughs> Several months ago. Yeah. Oh, look. The, the, the craziness? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have no clue. I am. Normal ish. Yeah. I actually need to make a note of that. Let me, let me make a note of this real quick. Cause... Couldn't probably have to do a little creativity on it, but uh, they, they really, that's one of the best working antennas they found for uh, high altitude. Cool. Made a note because seriously, um, I, I hope to game it in such a way that it is. The, I would love to be able to make it like a contact from Illinois to California on two meters and five watts. I would love to do that. Yeah. 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 Or I'll ask oh, some in a really far place where I can just go. Yeah, two meters, five watts gets really far. Yeah. <laughs> you ever played around up in the UHF? Uh, not a whole lot. Uh, certainly not in Skydive. Uh, uh, you, you know, you minute drive your antenna a little bit there. And the range is, you know, essentially the same as people. Well, certainly there's less use of the UHF spectrum, so hope, you know, maybe it, there's less noise and hopefully it's not far. Yeah, yeah we use, uh, I just picked up a. Full radio here. We use it as a control link on the speakers. Oh, cool! The thing is so old. This is one of the first, uh, first no. small radios that, that was uh, commercially available. If I have to go straight down, uh, very cool. If I was attached to him, uh, thanks. I enjoyed it. Thank you. <laughs> well, I'm gonna say it's challenging stuff. I am. I'm gonna try and hit you next time you're out. I'm being serious. Um, I've tried to.
guy grew up with. I've tried to get people. Like I know the distance is man. Kind of because I've done the anyway, same distance he, uh, to Wisconsin, okay. girl, right? Oh, but I've never gotten anyone in Indiana, much less in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Like they, so, um, are you familiar with HRCC? How many crash course? Are you familiar with ham radio? No. Ham radio crash course. Okay, so I put it on my ham radio crash courses. Ki six and AZ. He has a YouTube channel. Um, he also has a Facebook group that is directed at ham radio. Yeah. Right, and that's typically where I make that that listing there and on May one forty six. Five two three. I'm also going to work on HRCC's Discord and on Toad's Discord. Toad is temporarily offline. He also has a channel on YouTube. Great, lots of great content. Um, there's actually a whole mess of YouTube ham radio. Uh, there's Monday Night Ham Radio. Like, if you want to watch ham content, seriously, it starts on like at like six o'clock our time on, on Monday night and it ends at nine or nine or ten, and it's all back to back. So if you go to Temporarily Online's uh, channel, he has a playlist every every Monday and on every Thursday, same deal. Yeah, and we have an FDA contest every Thursday, so if you guys are into FDA, come join us tomorrow. It's every Thursday at uh, 7 o'clock. Oh, I know, when he was hours. like 90. Yeah. What kind of air shoots did you use before John Jones? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I I I I I I I I I I I that's amazing. Yes, absolutely. That is amazing. And, and it was, and it was, we actually, it was a valid contact. Oh, man, that is amazing. So, like I said, challenge accepted. It's doable. So I know what to do. I have the equipment. I like the sensitivity. So, you know, so, how, how can I put this in the place to get better? I mean, because I'll tell you right now, one of the hang ups I have is. Okay. 146.52. Just watch one of my videos and you'll see that basically the, the biggest criticism I get is you know, you keep off the top of somebody, you know, you keep the top of somebody. It's like, I know, but I'm, I, don't I, don't have a I don't have a choice. They're having a rag chew 200 miles away and the frequencies in use instead of just shifting. Uh, a tandem job is like $220. And if you want pictures and video, they charge under 110. I think they send somebody else, so it's three people. It's you know the, the tandem pair, and then an external videographer that takes pictures and video, and then edits the whole thing, and it looks pretty. I I think I would like to try it. Well, come on. But when it comes to it actually doing it. <laughs> so, you know, I'll tell you what I told my and my sister-in-law. I told my sister-in-law and my niece last year. And until we get to the door, until we're physically out of the door, like the moment so if this is if this is the aircraft and we're here, we're not out of the door, you can just say no. Now now I've broken the plane. You can say no all you want, and all I hear is guys go deep. <laughs> because once I have shifted the pilot, the pilot has a rear view mirror, believe it or not. Uh, let's see, let me go back to my presentation. Uh, see if it's on the pilot's picture. Uh, it's not visible here, but there's a mirror right here. We, we have a mirror installed of the airplane because the pilot is shifting the trim of the airplane with every person that is about to leave. Okay. The, when the pilot system sees the tandem instructor shift, he's already compensating for the load to leave. If we don't leave, we can, we can stall the airplane, and we ain't doing that. <laughs> so I got to the door with my sister-in-law, and I went, we have external video. So. I'm yelling at, at the external video person. I give him a hand cue, and I yell, ready, set, go. 
And I went, ready. And she said, no. I'm like, too late, set, go. <laughs> and you could read her lips in the video through the whole free fall. Curse, 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 curse. <laughs> Do the, uh, do the pilots have a special certificate? No. They have to be commercial pilots. So it can't be just any person with, with, a, with an Indian certificate. You have to be a commercial pilot. Uh, other than that, uh, in our plane, you have to have a turbine rating, an instrument rating, turbine. Uh, but in general, no. Uh, I, I want to say that our insurance requires our pilots to have a minimum of 500 hours. So if you're just at your commercial rating of 250 hours, right. building that 250 is expensive to get to 500 and whatnot. And uh, in skydiving, pilots are very transient. You'll have the same pilot for one or two years and they leave because all they're doing is just building up hours to go to the airlines. So once you hit 1,000 or 2,000 hours, you're gone. The closest I've done is jump off a perfectly sound bridge with a bungee. <laughs> you know, base jumping, same, similar, similar, yeah. No, no, I, I would not bungee jump. No, no, no. Oh, it's fun. It is fun. Yeah. It is a riot. No, I, can't, I, can't, I can't. And honestly, I just see this as an extension of certification. Yes, absolutely. I cannot jump straight down. Well, you can arc. Yeah, you can arc. Yeah. Like, 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 I can, like, like in a swimming pool, I can dive into it. But I cannot jump in person. Well, you have some of the, I think it's on the Grand Canyon or something like that. They actually have a, like, a sling. Yeah. That's something that looks like a buckle. Yeah. But, uh, no, I, I can't. Well, that's fine. Yeah. I mean, even uh, in a ride, uh, uh, he, uh, years ago he had me on some ride and straight down. No, I didn't do well. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Let me uh, stop my stream because I'm sure that someone's here yelling obscenities that I keep going. You know, there's, there's still three people here, believe it or not. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> but we're going to end the stream. Thank you so much. You're welcome.